Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, nice to be here. It's nice to be here with Ambassador Brownfield. So I just thought I made some kind of opening comments, turn it over to Ambassador Brownfield, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. So it's really, I think, a particularly important uh, uh, time for us as we think about kind of drug policy and our work in the international arena. Um, really uh, pleased to uh, be joined by Ambassador Brownfield, who's tremendous amount of expertise in diplomacy, I think, has really uh, moved uh, drug policy uh, reform efforts forward, uh, not just in the United States, but internationally. And so we're tremendously lucky to have him. Um, you know, I think that we know that every country has experienced significant challenges as it's related to the consequences of drug use and drug trafficking. Uh, and these efforts, uh, I think, have uh, underscored our um, tremendous opportunities to both work on public health and public safety sectors in terms of working together. Um, we also need to understand that people need access to essential medicines to relieve pain and improve their health and well-being. Uh, but we also need to prevent diversion because uh, particularly as the United States has been experiencing significant consequence around prescription drug use issues, we have to pay attention to diversion issues. Um, but we know that also we have to look more squarely at our demand reduction efforts for illegal drugs. I think we know that uh, the demand has a ripple effect that it fuels drug trafficking and violence and corruption. So addressing demand is one of the most important things that we can do. We're also, I think, uh, squarely rooted in the understanding that substance use disorders are diseases. These are not moral failings. These are not bad people doing bad things. But we know that people uh, need access to good prevention services. We can treat people and rehabilitate them, and people can recover. Um, the international community's focus on public health is really encouraging for making progress uh, as we move forward. Um, but as we make progress, I think each individual country really needs to do their own assessment in terms of how they have met the obligations under the International Drug Conventions and the 2009 Political Declaration and Plan for Action. I, I think we agree and support the three international conventions um, and understand that every country um, has a significant amount of latitude under those conventions uh, to reform drug policy, as we've done in the United States, in terms of focusing on public health-related priorities, looking at criminal justice reform issues, understanding that law enforcement has a key role to play, uh, but that for too long we've uh, relied on punitive approaches to people with substance use disorders. I think, you know, we've all seen, particularly in the United States, the 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 role that these punitive approaches have played as it relates to our over-reliance on incarceration for people with substance use disorders and disproportionality uh, for some of our communities in terms of the work that we're doing. So we've really, I think, made major strides in looking at drug policy reform efforts under our th uh, three conventions. Uh, you know, I, in February, our government continued to put forward a plan that balances this approach between public health and public safety. And, you know, as an example, for the first time in the history of uh, the United States, um, when we look at our, our, our drug control budget, uh, we have actually equally funded demand reduction efforts as supply reduction efforts. And I think that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an opportunity for not just the United States, but for all countries to look at how we appropriately finance uh, public health strategies that we know to be uh, important. Specifically in the United States, the president has called for over a billion dollars to support additional access to treatment in the United States as a commitment to our, our public health efforts. Um, but we know that we each country has to make meaningful changes uh, as it relates to drug policy, and our governments have the substantial uh, obligation uh, to continue to reform uh, drug policy within the existing treaties. Um, but we also want to ensure that we know that uh, not one size fits all, that we need to continue to adjust drug policy as it relates to particularly underserved populations in the United States and, and internationally. So when we think about women and children and youth, indigenous populations, those in, a, in the criminal justice system. So we know that UNGAS is uh, just a little over a month away, that this will be the first time in over 20 years uh, that we have met to really, I think, review our understanding of where we are, uh, where have we fallen short, what are the opportunities to really uh, move forward science and evidence and research on uh, evidence-based drug policy efforts, things like public health interventions, uh, 
medication-assisted treatment, criminal justice reform, alternatives to incarceration, and really strengthening the co uh, collaboration between public health and public safety uh, are become important priorities for us. So, you know, obviously C&D and uh, our movement toward UNGAS are, are really reflective of kind of our understanding of drug policy and science and research. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Ambassador Brownfield. Well, I thank you, Dr. Botticelli. And let me offer just a couple of comments from the United Nations perspective. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are gathered here in Vienna uh, for the meeting, the annual meeting of the UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs, or the CND. Conceivably the most important CND meeting uh, in several decades. Why? Because in five weeks' time, uh, the leadership of the world will gather at UN headquarters uh, for the first special session of the UN General Assembly uh, on drugs and a review of global drug policy in nearly 20 years. There is, as we all know, an intense debate going on on our planet in terms of what global drug policy should be. I would suggest to you gentlemen that for the last 30 or 40 years, uh, this debate has been dominated by the two extremes. One extreme which argues simplistically that if we simply legalized everything, the problem would go away. A second extreme which argues with almost the same degree of simplicity, <coughs> if only we would prohibit everything, the problem would go away. As is usually the case, ladies and gentlemen, there are solutions and they are found somewhere in between the two extremes. It is the position of the United States government that there is fertile ground for serious and pragmatic reform in drug policy that the upcoming on gas can in fact consider. We can open by reaffirming the three international conventions that have governed our planet's approach toward drug policy for more than 50 years and in fact have served a very useful purpose. Within those conventions, we can find space for a greater emphasis on public health in terms of drug policy. We can find possibilities for reform of criminal justice approaches, alternatives to incarceration, sentencing reform, uh, drug courts, court supervised drug treatment. We can find space for more development and alternative development ideas, uh, for focus on new psychoactive substances, which the pharmaceutical industry is now producing at a rate far greater than our ability as the international community to register and schedule those new products. And we can find an opportunity at the UMGAS to recommit to combating and eventually defeating those transnational criminal organizations that traffic in the product for economic gain using violence and bloodshed as their business model. Ladies and gentlemen, there is clearly a role for civil society in this process, but the word we emphasize is balance. Civil society is not monolithic. Not all NGOs take the same position, and UNGAS, as well as this CND, are opportunities for us to hear both sides of the argument. May I suggest to you, here in Vienna, we are in the city about which the entire United Nations organization says there is something called the spirit of Vienna. And what that means in UN speak, I believe, is that unlike other headquarters for UN organizations, here in Vienna there is a tradition for finding common ground and eventually producing consensus on policy and reform. We hope the spirit of Vienna will continue through the upcoming UNGAS. That's my opening comment, and I throw the floor open 
thank you very much. I have one question for Mr. Botticelli, one question for Mr. Brownfield. The question to Mr. Brownfield is that yesterday Mr. Werner Sieg from uh, the International Narcotics Control Board said that the legalization of no medical use of cannabis is not in line with international conventions. And uh, as we know, several states of the United States uh, uh, made the recreational use of cannabis legal for adults. So do you think that this is not in line with the international uh, law? And if it's not, what the US government is uh, about to do with this problem? My second question is that uh, you mentioned there is an ongoing opioid ep epidemic in mm -hmm. the US with several victims of overdose. And um, uh, some NGOs and uh, even a mayor in New York State proposed the idea of opening supervised injection sites to uh, tackle this problem. Uh, and there are several such facilities in Europe. Uh, what is your government's position on that? Can I lead? Sure. Let me take on the marijuana and, uh, c question as relates to the three conventions. It will perhaps not surprise you to learn that the government of the United States believes uh, that we are still in compliance with the three international drug control conventions while acknowledging that four of the 50 states of the Union have in fact uh, decided through public referendum uh, to legalize the cultivation, purchase, sale, production uh, of marijuana. We believe this because it is our position uh, that the conventions themselves provide a sufficient amount of discretion within the text of the conventions to allow this sort of approach. Our argument simply stated, and as briefly as I can make it, is that the conventions do not require or obligate any member state to criminalize and prosecute individuals for consumption of any particular product. The conventions recognize that member states have different constitutional systems and allow those constitutions to have an impact on how they will carry out their treaty obligations. The United States system is federal, where most of the law enforcement and law enforcement authority, 90 percent, is in the hands of the individual states. The United States government has a limited number of law enforcement resources as a matter of discretion. It is the government's authority and right to determine how to use those limited resources. Our objective remains the same as it has been since we first supported uh, the very first International Drug Control Convention, and that is to discourage and work eventually to eliminate the harm caused by dangerous drugs on our citizens and our communities. Marijuana remains a proscribed and therefore illicit substance under the Federal Controlled Substances Act, and it is therefore our contention that we remain in compliance with our convention obligations. We acknowledge others have different opinions. We will continue this discussion into the future. Great. Dr. B. Great, thank you. So as you've discussed, you know, we have a significant opioid epidemic in the United States. Um, I, I think it's important to talk about our approach to this. So we, we know that this epidemic has been largely fueled by the overprescribing of prescription pain medication in the United States. I think that's why we, you know, understand the obligation, our treaty obligations in other countries in terms of looking at appropriate access. But I think we want to give uh, some caution uh, as we look uh, at how we prescribe these prescription pain medications in the United States. You know, we've seen a, uh, a small percentage of people who transition from prescription pain medication to heroin. Newer heroin users, four-fifths of new heroin users actually started by misusing pain medication. So we really got to focus on how do we diminish uh, the supply and misuse of prescription pain medication as a result of this. But, you know, our, uh, our approach to this has been in a number of different areas uh, as it relates to not only prescription drugs but heroin use. 
One, wider access to medication-assisted treatment. You know, we have these three highly effective medications that are underutilized in our treatment system, they're underutilized in our healthcare system, they're underutilized in our criminal justice system. So we've really been focusing on more widespread access to, uh, um, uh, to medications, as well as more widespread distribution of naloxone, which is an overdose prevention refer, uh, reversal agent. And we've seen a tremendous uptake, not only in the health community, but in the law enforcement community to re reduce overdoses. We've also been significantly concerned by the dramatic increase in viral hepatitis that we've seen associated with injection drug use and some isolated cases of significant HIV exposure uh, in parts of the country where we haven't been doing that. We were very uh, happy to see that uh, Congress um, after decades, reversed a long-standing ban on federal funding to support uh, syringe exchange programs. Uh, you know, uh, th it still does not allow for purchase of needles, but it supports all the other programmatic areas to do that. Um, you know, we have not taken a position on safe injection sites. I think we're very interested to see what happens uh, at the local level with this. And and let me say two things. I think of how, how we think about both needle exchange and other uh, uh, efforts to reduce harm. That not only do we need to think about how do some of these interventions reduce harm from infectious disease, but really provide a vehicle for people and motivation for people to access treatment. So I think that as we look at uh, all of these interventions, it's really important that we focus not just on reducing infectious disease among folks, but how do we use that as an opportunity to really engage people and move them toward reduced drug use behavior. Thank you. I have a question about the uh, death use, use of the death penalty to relate uh, drug rate is going down. Yesterday also, the, the Mr. Pedro mentioned about that. And uh, what, what is the US position toward it? And do you, do you think that you can find common ground about it in, uh, before Angus? Sure. Let, let me take on that one since it is uh, directly tied uh, to the potential Angus declaration and outcome document. The United States of America does not apply the death penalty to, to, to drug cases. Uh, 32 states of the Union and under certain circumstances the federal government does permit the death penalty, penalty but they are applied to cases that involve the taking of life and murder. Consequently, the United States government uh, has no concern, no problem with language in an ungassed declaration that relates to the death penalty on drug-related cases. However, it is also the judgment of the United States government that there is not consensus in the international community on this issue. Therefore, to the extent we are taking a position it is a tactical position, one of questioning how much time, effort, and resources should be dedicated to an effort if we already know it will not achieve consensus. If consensus builds on this issue, we will join it because it is not inconsistent with our own policy. It is our judgment that there is not consensus on this issue as of today, Tuesday, the 15th of March, 2016. <clears throat> um, don't get me wrong, but uh, I can really understand how the US can reaffirm the convention and at the same time, the watchdog of this convention is saying that the US is not complying with them. I mean, I can understand. And I have a second question about the Vienna state that Mr. Bromfield mentioned. And as you know, the, there is a draft that is being negotiated by consensus. Uh, uh, what means that if, if one country blocks some, something, um, this this is not going to be in the draft and it's not going to be today. Maybe it can be reopened in New York. 
but indeed it's somehow strange that there is going to be a debate about drugs, but some ideas are not going to be debated. So I don't know what do you uh, think about that. I mean, about, about this process that some ideas are just out of the table because it's some kind of taboo or I don't know. Should I? You let, want to let me start, and then and then. So, so, so you know, re relative to our obligation under the treaties, I think that you know what our our, our position under federal policy has remained the same. That that we uh, uh, um, that uh, uh, legalization of marijuana for I actually say personal use, not recreational use, um, is not consistent with federal policy, and that you know we have a constitution in the United States that allows certain of our states to be able to do that. And we, while it's remained illegal, you know, our Department of Justice has basically said that we are not using limited federal law enforcement uh, to go after people for low level personal use, which I think is entirely consistent with with our policy um, and, in, and consistent with uh, our, our meeting the conventions. I will say, and then uh, Ambassador Brownfield can talk more in terms of kind of the, the role of civil society in, uh, in in our our work, but but I can tell you that not um, in a wide variety of settings we have significant consultation with uh, many people in civil society and and many uh, folks in civil society who don't necessarily agree with the entirety of kind of U.S. drug policy issues and I think it's important for us to continue to maintain ongoing dialogue with our civil society and with the wide variety of NGOs um, as, as it relates to their input in terms of, of drug policy. And, and uh, you know, we actually had a reception last night with a lot of groups that I think where we have a significant amount of consensus where we are, but I think who are advocating positions that, that the United States doesn't agree with. So I think we have to maintain ongoing dialogue with people um, who don't um, necessarily agree with everything that we're doing, and I think that's that's an important role to play. But I think, as Ambassador uh, Brownfield said, we also have to make sure that that we allow for the multiplicity of voices within civil society who have a range of positions on these issues to have room for their voices being heard as well. So I think that there is an important that we feel an important obligation to make sure that we're engaging with uh, with. Uh, 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 the wide variety of, of opinions uh, as it relates to, to what uh, our policy positions are. Sure. And, and let me just add uh, to both of your questions, which are, which are quite specific, and let me give you a very specific answer. Uh, Werner Sipp, uh, a gentleman that I hold in the highest esteem and respect enormously, I believe he is and has been a superb president of the INCB. Uh, the INCB, when it speaks and utters and, and renders a decision, there is a process by which it is communicated. All 13 members of the board discuss, debate, and reach a conclusion. That conclusion is then placed in a written document and provided to whatever member state or whatever organization is the subject of the decision. When a member of the board speaks, the member of the board is offering his personal opinion, just as the president of a Supreme Court, when speaking only as a, a, an individual member, is offering a personal opinion. When a court renders a judgment, there is a process by which the judgment is uh, delivered uh, to the larger public. That, I believe, is the difference. It is not that I do not respect Mr. Sipp's views. In fact, I think his views are even a bit more sophisticated than you have suggested. I merely say the INCB as an institution, as designated by the United Nations and the UN system, has not rendered a formal judgment on this issue at this point in time. The second question is kind of a question uh, that I submit uh, is about 60 years uh, in the making, and that is the United Nations system and their inclination to make decisions by consensus. 
Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Perhaps it is a question we should have asked in the year 1945 uh, when the United Nations Charter was first endorsed. It is a reality. But what kind of reality is it? It is a democratic reality. There is no uh, no censoring on who can express a view at the young gas in five weeks time. If a president, prime minister, minister, or other delegation head uh, wishes to express a view on any issue whatsoever, he or she will do so. Uh, it will become a matter of public record. And if, if, if there is a groundswell of support, one assumes that that will become the decision or the policy of young gas. However, if it is a minority view in a democratic institution, the minority does not get to make the decisions for the entire organization. <coughs> I know that's a simple response, uh, but at the end of the day, that is the system of the United Nations as we have had for more than 60 years. Um, I, I just wanted to re return to that. You mentioned that a minority view wouldn't be the one that results, but in effect, when a minority of countries is blocking uh, something that the majority of countries would like, uh, criminalization or death penalty, and obviously that's touchy, but I, I still struggle to see how that is democratic. Um, and that seems to be what's going on here. A handful of countries are standing in the way of, of certain progressive things. And on that note, uh, you mentioned that on uh, Mr. Brown's vote on the death penalty, that you're not going to advocate for that, that the policy of the U.S. is that that shouldn't happen. Are there red lines for the U.S. in terms of what does need to be in the document, or is it really kind of you're leaving it up to, to other countries? Um, and uh, for you, I was wondering federally, uh, in terms of you know marijuana, something like the scheduling of marijuana, do you think that it should be not listed as a Schedule One drug? I mean, that seems to be something that is a reasonable ask. Um, you, I would imagine you could say that people that smoke weed shouldn't go to jail. So should it not be scheduled? So, so it's not up to my personal opinion whether or not marijuana should be scheduled. There, there is actually a scientific process that we have to go through and that we rely on in the United States to look at where drugs should be scheduled. Let, let me say a couple things about the scheduling which I think are important. Uh, w one of the things that I've heard about where marijuana is scheduled is, you know, is it, it's in the same classification as other drugs. And I think it's important to understand that scheduling is not a relative risk scale, right? So I think it's really important to say, you know, drugs are scheduled based on, you know, what's the potential therapeutic, what's the therapeutic value of those drugs, and what are the health harms associated with those. So there is a pretty rigorous process that the United States government looks at in terms of where those drugs get scheduled. And, you know, I think that, you know, so again, it's not my personal opinion. I think we have to continue to rely on that scientific process to determine whether or not drugs meet those criteria in terms of where they get scheduled. Yep, and I'll offer a, a quick comment on, on your red line question. Of course the United States government, like every government in the world, has certain, call them red lines, firmly held positions on which it will take a strong, strong position. Uh, I've suggested to you that, uh, that death penalty as applied to drug cases is not one of those. Uh, is there an issue in terms of minority or majority? I suppose so. I suggest you're asking the wrong person on this question, however. I have said before, I repeat right now, the United States government does not take a position on whether uh, language that, that, that addresses the application of the death penalty on drug cases is incorporated into the declaration. If you have a comment that is, that is connected to that, perhaps you should be talking to some other representatives, not the representatives of the United States government. But, but let me go back to a point that you were making before, and I hope that's not what you're saying, that you know, because uh, 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 there's a majority, because there's a minority of uh, of countries who are pushing for progressive reforms. It, it almost says like the rest of the kind of majority of countries are not pushing for progressive reform. And, and I think that we have demonstrated, and I think the vast majority of countries are saying within the existing treaties, there is a significant amount of drug policy reform that we can do. And that includes things like, 
enhancing a public health approach to this issue, of looking at criminal justice reform related issues and alternatives to incarceration. And Brassett Brownfield later today is actually going to be hosting a side event on alternatives to incarceration. So, so, so I don't like, uh, and I don't think this is what you're saying, this kind of polarization of views where you have kind of, you know, folks who are entrenched in terms of drug policy work and those other minority countries who are pushing for progressive reforms. Because I don't think that that's the consensus of uh, uh, most countries, and I certainly don't think it's emblematic of, of the United States position on this. Yeah, well, I was actually saying that, I'm not sure if that's what you meant, but that there's a minority that are active against kind of progressive laws, and they tend to have an outsized influence. I mean, I think we could all name a few, but I won't, because you probably guys, you guys don't want to on that, but that process, that does seem to happen here. You talk to anyone here, they say, you know, they list on one hand kind of who's blocking things. So just that, I mean, I can understand how the consensus process works, but it seems like that could raise some issues. Mm -hmm. Please. Uh, is the third harm reduction, is uh, that uh, uh, something that U.S. Uh, can, in the negotiation, take into the declaration or not? And to uh, you said that the uh, federal uh, uh, government uh, don't accept marijuana, but ENCB has in, in the former uh, document said that you must have control over your territory. That in some uh, states, uh, Colorado, for instance, you you will allow it. They will allow it. Sure. But is this a way like a snake? You can't you can't. Uh, say full out that stop them or not? So you have control over your territory in, in the question of uh, Mariana. So, so le uh, let me kind of talk first and then I'll let Ambassador Rothfield talk about this issue around harm reduction. I've been doing public health work for uh, longer than I care to admit. <laughs> um, Since before I was born. <laughs> I like to think. And the term harm reduction I think is challenging because it means so many different things to so many different people. And I think part of what we are trying to look at is, you know, wh what is the consensus in terms of approaches to reducing the harms associated with drug use? And how do we move people toward uh, health and well-being? And I think there is a consensus in our position is, you know, th there is a tremendous amount of consensus around kind of this principled focus on reducing the harms. And uh, yeah, I'll you know, turn it over to the ambassador for how that gets uh, uh, discussed as it relates to, to the processes here. But, but, I, but I think it's important if you look at kind of the technical consultation and if you look at the interventions that are supported uh, or uh, 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 those kinds of, of interventions, the United States, I think, is very forward-leaning in terms of its support for those kinds of interventions. Yeah. In fact, it, and this is, it is not my intention uh, to, to reveal an entire negotiating strategy or negotiating process within the CND and the upcoming UNGAS uh, at, at this meeting, but in many ways for the United States government, the discussions over harm reduction are a labeling issue. In the United States, and I, I acknowledge, I am now offering a national position, not a global position. Over the last 10 or 15 years, in common public usage, the term harm reduction has come increasingly to be interpreted as a backhanded way to describe legalization. What we have asked respectfully modestly and humbly in these discussions is to find a new description or a new label. We are, as, as, uh, as Mr. Botticelli has just indicated, in fact not only comfortable with but believe we play a leadership role in much of the rest of the world in terms of much of the substantive matter uh, that the international community means when they say harm reduction. And in order to avoid the confusion that would ensue in our own country, our request is a very simple one of finding a new subject heading. If we mean reducing social damage caused by drugs, 
perhaps we can say, reducing social damage caused by drugs and in that way not contribute uh, to both confusion and passionate debate uh, in at least one country in the United Nations system. Briefly, on the matter of international convention obligations and national territory, you are, of course, correct that that language appears in two of the international drug control conventions. But also, the language appears in the two international drug control conventions that states that individual member states through their own constitutional processes will be permitted to enforce the conventions in accordance with their constitutions. So we have, in a sense, two different parts of the convention that can lead one to different conclusions. I have offered you our conclusion. Reasonable minds may differ. At least up until this point in time, there has not been a formal adjudication on that point. Of course there is debate over this issue. Of course there are disagreements on this issue. This is part of what democracy, whether in a national or international context, are all about. And in fact, I think it's quite healthy for the international system. If if, if others disagree, I welcome hearing your views. Having written a, a dissertation 25 years ago on the war on drugs in the Andes, which was the time of uh, President Ronald Reagan <coughs> and George Bush father, I was quite astonished uh, in the advent of this Angus conference to find almost everybody taking distance to war on drugs. Uh, also in the interview, the television interview, you were inviting us to look at in the invitation for this press conference, there was a, a, a distance to the, to the past war on drugs. So my, the, the question linked to it would be, can, will we see any, any changes in the field of international cooperation uh, from the United States of America? I'll give my assessment. Po possibly, possibly linked to that, uh, back in these times, there was the perception in, in Congress that certain drug producing uh, and transit countries would lack the political will to take action yeah. against drugs. So there was a certification process established. Will certification go on? So I'll give my assessment then. Uh, so, so I, I, I like to think that we've learned a lot over the past 40 years. You know, our, our scientific um, evidence, I think, as it relates to understanding addiction as a disease, I think has really influenced our approach to this. And, you know, I, I've often talked on our over-reliance on punitive approaches to this. Our jails and prisons are full of people who are there largely as a result of their substance use. And I think we've really learned that we can have effective prevention, intervention, treatment programs, that we can divert people away from our criminal justice system without increasing crime, right? So that's the, you know, so, so there's a confluence of this. I, I, I will also say too, though, that, I, you know, when, uh, th that there is a role for law enforcement, you know, that, you know, but we need to use that law enforcement response for you know, kind of people who traffic drugs in our community, that we still have to reduce the supply of drugs. We have you know many, much of our overdoses these days are attributable to heroin and fentanyl that are just flooding the the streets of the United States. So law enforcement supply reduction does continue to play a critical role, but this is all about balance, right? This is about making sure that we have a balance related to this. And and you know my take, uh, you know at least over the past few years is that there is a tremendous amount of consensus among kind of that kind of balanced uh, approach uh, to this. And, you know, are there outlier countries? Certainly. But, um, but, but I think that the, you know, that the vast overriding consensus is on this balanced approach, on greater focus on public health strategies and alternatives to incarceration, and reserving our criminal justice system and law enforcement for really those serious violations. Sure. I mean, just a couple of additional points. Uh, some historical uh, context for you. In the year 1973, the then President of the United States, Richard Nixon, said publicly we were engaged in a war on drugs. 
He was trying to make, I believe, he's no longer around to consult, but I believe uh, the point he was making was that this is such an important issue for the United States of America, we will treat it as though it were a war. 20 years later, uh, the recently inaugurated new president of the United States, Bill Clinton, said both in private and in public, this is not a war. We do not make war on our own citizens. We have not been engaged in the United States government in a war on drugs, at least, since the year 1993. I understand it is a popular expression. I cannot stop others from using it, uh, but you should not operate on the assumption that it in any way reflects United States government policy uh, on drugs, nor has it for more than 20 years. Do we have a certification process? I would use this as an example uh, 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 of what uh, Mr. Botticelli was just describing, which is the evolution, the, the, the adjustment, the modification, the changes in policy over 40 or 50 years. More than 40 years ago, when the United States Congress uh, passed the International Narcotics Control Act, uh, they required the Department of State, and specifically that part of, uh, of it which I run today, uh, to engage in an annual exercise by which we assessed and determined whether other governments were in fact uh, taking sufficient statutory steps uh, to address the drug problem and the drug crisis. That is no longer the law. Why? Because we realized over time that that process, which came to be known as the certification process, was actually causing more damage than good. What we have now is a much more fact-based annual report process called the International Narcotics Strategy and Control Report, or INCSER. It is factual in nature. Every government has the opportunity to express its own view and quite frankly they can disagree or differ in terms of the judgments reached. It is an improvement over where we were 20 or 30 years ago. It is an example of what Mr. Botticelli is describing when he says governments will learn, adjust, change their policies as they deal with current and changing realities. Of the international cooperation, uh, you, you mentioned that there's a lot of heroin coming out, coming from Afghanistan and other parts of the world. Not Afghanistan. Go ahead, please. I'm sorry. From Mexico, or yeah. yeah. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Finish okay. your question. Uh, before uh, uh, the director, uh, your former director, Kalikovsky, had a good cooperation with uh, the Russian uh, Victor Ivanov, I think it was, in this matter with the international. Uh, Cooperation. Now we have the sanction, and now you have uh, uh, Iran. It has uh, opened up uh, these hardliners uh, countries. Do you have the cooperation, of, and will have the cooperation with them according to drug uh, uh, trafficking in, in, in the future? Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so let me just correct. The, yeah. You know, the, the vast majority of of heroin and uh, um, is actually coming into the United States from Mexico and. Uh, uh, yes, and trafficked into into the United States, and uh, you know, I I think, and I think Ambassador Brownfield would agree that over the uh, we've always had some pretty significant uh, uh, positive relationships with Mexico. Uh, I think that over the past, particularly six months, uh, we've had a, a, a series of very positive and strategic engagements with uh, the uh, 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 Mexican government as it's related. Uh, to not only the increase in heroin that we see, but the violence in Mexico associated with poppy cultivation. Uh, Ambassador Brownfield and I were just in Mexico last week, week and a half, week and a half ago, where we've had where we had uh, significant, I think, productive discussions with uh, the Attorney General, with every segment of the Mexican government, in terms of both uh, 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 their willingness to have focused action and attention on this issue and our support for their for their work so um, while we want to continue to make sure that uh, we're, we and they are taking actions uh, on this issue um, that uh, I think we've been heartened by the conversation I, I, I will also say too that I think it's fair for our partner nations to also 
uh, um, come to this table understanding that there's a shared responsibility here. And, you know, I think we certainly understand our demand reduction responsibilities um, as it relates to how that drives the drug trade internationally. And I think we have very positive movement in what we've done in the United States to say this is a shared responsibility, that when we, when, that we continue to move forward in very, very strong ways to reduce the demand for drug in the United States, which has consequences not just here but internationally. So I think, that, I think it's a, a good opportunity for understanding that there is shared responsibility in this issue. And cooperation with other countries like Russia or Iran? Sure, I'll, I'll add a point on that, mm -hmm. uh, because the, the, the way you framed the question was, uh, was, and you described it as hardline countries, uh, I would prefer to say every country, every one of the 196 countries, I believe, that are part of the United Nations system has to deal with its own realities. It, one size does not fit all. Every country in the world does not confront exactly the same drug abuse and drug control situation uh, as every other. This is part of the United Nations reality. This is part of the reality that we must deal with as we try, try to work our way through a final ungas declaration and decision because it must take into account the differing realities of 196 countries and their governments. I, for one, am extremely sympathetic to a government and a country that is suffering a major drug epidemic, whether it is heroin and opioids, or, or cocaine, or methamphetamine, uh, or new psychoactive substances. I believe we have to take into account their own positions and their own realities as we try to formulate a global policy. I believe a global policy does have to have space within it to allow all different sets of realities uh, to be incorporated within both the conventions and the policy strategy plan that is endorsed uh, by a special session of the UN General Assembly. To this extent, I, I, I think this is in response to some of our earlier questions, part of the reality that we must deal with. Uh, it, that is why consensus is not necessarily a bad thing if at the end of the day you want a policy that every nation in the world can accept, uh, endorse, and support, it has to have space uh, for all of those differing realities. It's a fair question, but the very nature of the question leads you to this sort of United Nations solution. Um, <coughs> speaking of Victor Ivanov, uh you know, uh, since Russia annexed Crimea, they shut down the methadone centers because in Russia, Russia methadone is illegal and more than 30 people died. And uh, we asked him yesterday what his ideas about this, and he said that, yeah, because methadone is bad and, and it's proven that more people die because of methadone, then they're without it. But you have a, a, a good experience of science and research in the U.S. about methadone, so do you think you can somehow let them know that it's working or you know, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I'm not sure to what extent that we can kind of influence in terms of their decision. I, I, I mean, I think you know in terms of U.S. policy and practice on what that is, and part of it is uh, uh, relying on the science. Uh, methadone is, has been around for 50 years. It's been one of the most evaluated medications that we have here. Um, and so I do find it, uh, you know, unfortunate when kind of other countries don't rely on science and data to um, uh, look at both their policies and practice, uh, particularly uh, in the midst of, uh, you know, kind of widespread heroin and opioid use. Um, you know, I can tell you that in the United States, you know, that's why um, uh, uh, more widespread access to all the three FDA-approved medications for opioid use disorders is part of our prime strategy. So, um, because we know that, you know, uh, again, that people on uh, uh, methadone have, uh, and people, pe pe particularly people who are on maintained on methadone, um, uh, uh, do far better than uh, those who would just get um, uh, no medications as it relates to their ongoing therapy. I think you beat them by a couple seconds, so you, you get to Micro go. Seconds. <laughs> Micro seconds. Micro seconds. I'm closer, so the lights are <laughs> uh, Just following on that, I was curious, I mean, it's probably difficult to 
declare on this stuff, but in terms of policies implemented in other countries, so say Portugal, decriminalizing, both of you made clear there's no one size fits all. It's a very small country. The US is, I don't know how many times larger than Portugal, but I actually don't know. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Right. <laughs> he probably does. Yeah, I'll say it. Just in, in evaluating, I don't know if there's a process internally for evaluating uh, within the U.S. government uh, how decriminalization has worked. Would you consider Portugal's uh, steps of success in that national context? Would you think the Czech Republic? I mean, Uruguay is too soon, um, although that probably wouldn't be a success or not. It's just legalization. Sure. But how, how do you evaluate those? So, so, so I'll start, you know, from, from the broadest possible framework. I, you know, I, if we're science and evidence based, I think we have to look at a whole host of issues, not just here in the United States, but internationally as they uh, um, as they roll forward. Uh, you know, I, I looked at the kind of Portugal evaluation, right? And part of even their own evaluation as a result to some uh, some of the positive outcomes that they have been achieved by their own attribution has said, well, some of this can probably be related to the fact that they significantly amplified their public health and demand reduction strategies, right? And, and so, you know, again, I think we're always open to, to seeing where the science and evidence takes us um, and, and to look at how we can continue to update and uh, refine drug policy based on all of the scientific information uh, that we have in front of us to do that. So, you know, again, but I think, you know, looking at what other countries have done, I think become equally important. But, but again, I, you know, one of the things that I think is important and lots of discussion here internationally is let's implement the things that we know to be effective, right? And so we know that those public health strategies demand, you know, prevention, intervention, treatment, recovery supports are effective. And, and I think what we have been doing in the United States, and I think there's a consensus internationally, is let's first, before we start experimenting with other things, let's first start implementing the things that we know to be effective. So, you know, we, people have been talking about new approaches, and, you know, a, a new approach is let's fully implement the things that we know to be effective. And I think that's been our approach in the United States is, you know, let's, let's make sure that we're implementing those things that we know to be effective as it relates to reducing drug use and its consequences. Sure. I mean, I, I would only add that from an international kind of policy uh, and even legal perspective, uh, reinforcing the point we were making earlier of having learned lessons over the last 40 or 50 years one lesson that perhaps we as an international community have learned is that the route to success is not for one government to judge uh, another government in its efforts, uh, but rather to accept the reality uh, that individual nations will pursue uh, individual national drug control policies. The obligation that we all have is to comply with the terms of the three international drug control conventions. That is an obligation we have because we have all individually chosen to ratify the conventions and as a consequence we have taken on that obligation. Who is in a position to determine if a government is in compliance or not in compliance, that is not a decision for an individual government to make. That is a decision in accordance with the conventions for the International Narcotics Control Board, which in turn has a procedure by which it makes a judgment and issues that judgment. That's my suggestion. I agree with everything Mr. Botticelli has just said. This does not mean we're not learning lessons. We're not paying attention. We're not, we're not determining what has worked and what has not worked, both in the United States and in the other 195 nations in the UN system. But it is not that one nation judges or renders judgment on another. Okay, I think that's about all the time we have. So Great. thank you all very much for coming and thank you Director Bobby and, and um, Ambassador Brownfield for joining us and taking your time to discuss everything with us. If you have any further questions, um, if you don't know how to reach me, I can give you my card and we can well, pass them on. I, I, I have a uh, brief question, yes. But um, the it was a tie. He did. Oh, have, that's right. He, he, he did. He was. A, he did have his hand it, up. It Sorry about that. You're right. We're good for one it's, more minute. It's been brief. 
I know that the federal uh, government dis distances itself from the uh, legalization of cannabis in the, in the four states, but is the federal government monitoring what's happening there just to share and take account of the, I don't know, if the illicit market is shrinking or if there are more people that are uh, increasing number of people that uh, are smoking marijuana or I don't know. I, I, are you monitoring yep. what's happening there? Um, are you going to share it with the international community? Or? Sure. So, so, so let me first say a couple of things. So uh, to answer your question, simply yes. So we're looking at this. I, I, I also think it's important to understand that uh, s some of these states actually didn't have a tremendously good monitoring system in mm -hmm. place to be able to do that. So I think kind of the first and foremost is, you know, do we have the monitoring systems in place to look at both the public health and public safety impact of what's happening in these four states? I think that, you know, our, our approach to this has been ongoing monitoring, whether it's state level and national level databases to be able to look at kind of both, again, both the public health and public safety impact of, of these issues. I, 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 you know, I will tell you that I think it's, so, so first of all, it's not, while, while we'll continue to be transparent about those implications. It's uh, not our intent to, um, uh, to um, uh, publish a report, if you will, in terms of, you know, success or failure, but just to um, uh, be very transparent on the data as, as we get the data. I do think at this point it's really kind of too soon to tell since, uh, you know, many of these have not been implemented that long ago to really, uh, to, to really understand kind of what the, what the impact has been. But that's been our plan all along to continue to monitor those.